Most of us, if we know anything at all about the Hare Krishnas, we know two things. First, there's that chant of theirs. Excuse me, ma'am. Excuse me, ma'am. Are you flying Continental or United today? Excuse me, ma'am. I had to ask you, miss. Excuse me, sir. Big smile. And then, of course, there's that stuff at the airport. And, uh, we're monks. You've heard of monks? The ones with funny haircuts? And this book is talking about a methodology, a practice of lifestyle that can help you to recognize the one God and to help you become more conscious of Him in your daily life. So this book is discussing how we can actually implement practices in our daily life that help us become more and more uh -huh. conscious. You may already be doing some of them, but this may give you a few more ideas. Honestly, like, I you don't can't read? take anything. I've got so much stuff to Oh, I'll give you something which is so small, it won't even, you won't even feel it. Thank you. Excuse me, sir. You're flying kind of now. Keep smiling. Hey, nice suit. Religious faith, typically so very personal for Hare Krishnas, devotion is inescapably public. You have good heart. If you need a gauge, it costs us five to print. People try and get five, ten, thousand. Can you give even a couple five of dollars? Five dollars. Sure. Right. Even. Okay, there you go. Right. Hey, that's very kind of it. If you sort through just about any religion, you'll find benefits, you'll find burdens. For Krishnas, the benefit of eternal salvation can come at an extraordinary cost. What time's your flight? It's not just that they stand out in a crowd. Their ancient faith carries some serious recent baggage. Baggage that raises shocking allegations about children and abuse. Baggage that could soon trigger an historic dismantling of an established religion across North America. In 1988, a documentary filmmaker headed into the hills outside Wheeling, West Virginia. This is the Hare Krishna community of New Vrindavan. Nestled on 200 acres deep in the wooded hills, it is a community devoted to worship. This is the hill that we used to go play on, and there was always cows on that hill, so we would go and play with the cows. Up here there was a swing set right there. So there were a lot of happy times for you here? Um, this was like my happiest times. Her name is Lakshmi, short for Lakshmana. She was named not by her parents, but by their guru, in honor of one of the many wives of the Hindu god Krishna. They're all songs about all the different demons that would come and kill Krishna, come and try to kill Krishna, and Krishna would kill all the demons and protect his friends. And you still remember them? Mm-hmm. I still sing them. <laughs> Lakshmi, now in her mid-twenties, was five years old in 1979, the year she first started school at a rustic farm near the Hare Krishna's Golden Palace in West Virginia. Early on, she loved to draw. Like, I really believed that Krishna was real, and I really <laughs> believed all these stories. And so even though I don't believe them now, they, they bring back a feeling to me from when I was really young, from when I was really innocent, before things got really bad. like a cow, seeing a cow, like cows were our best friends. Cows were sacred and 
like they were the mother, and I still feel that when I see cows. There is something beautiful in it. A family in Vrindavan is bound together by the same love, but with a different focus. So we try to keep everything in this community centered around the worship of God. Our whole lifestyle means Krishna consciousness, means consciousness of God. Chris Carlson is Lakshmi's dad. He was a talented artist who struggled to raise his young daughter the right way. Somehow or other have to educate her to give her the chance to understand that there's more to life than simply eating, sleeping, mating, and defending. Lakshmi also had a stepmom. Her Sanskrit name was Sumati. My relationship with Lakshmana is to help her, try to help her understand that she is a servant of God and that by um, chanting Hare Krishna and by serving the deities in the temple and serving her spiritual master, these are the things that will really make her happy. Before stepmom Sumati, there was her birth mom, Anna Keys. And I'd spend many, many hours with her drawing and reading and taking her to the park. And she was the apple of my eye. She, I, I, I didn't feel a need to have any more children. She was just a perfect child, you know. And, and um, we just loved each other and so much. We were inseparable. But by the time Lakshmi was seven, mother and daughter were separated. And therein lies our tale, a tale of innocence and betrayal, a tale shared by dozens, perhaps hundreds, of Krishna children whose memories of their childhood were anything but happy. It's hard for me to go back to that time right now, like, because I was there for so long and I was in so much pain for so long that it's hard for me to open that door back up and go back into it. But, um, There was never a moment in my childhood when I wasn't terrified. But baby Krishna made himself as heavy as a mountain. He caught Trina Bartha's neck and made him fall down, down, down to the ground. Sinful Trina Bartha, demons have to die, but Krishna is alive. Down, down to the ground, sinful Trina It all started in the 60s. Love in the streets, a war in Vietnam, George Harrison mixing rock and roll with the mantra from Krishna. They thought their parents' lives, for the most part, were unsatisfactory to them. Some of them thought their parents' lives were actually failures. They wanted to find a different way of life. ways to kind of opt out of the society, whether that was drug-induced dropping out of the society or not. Others began to look for real alternatives to that society, and, and Krishna consciousness became one such alternative, at least for some. But the Krishnas were very different, in many ways the antithesis of the 60s. No sex, no drugs, no rock and roll. When I first went to a Hare Krishna temple, and they told me about these four principles, no meat, no intoxication, no gambling, no illicit sex, I looked the guy right in the eye and I said, what do you do? I was going through some pretty dramatic, uh, traumatic changes in my life. I, I just separated from my first wife. I was with this girlfriend. It was chaotic. Some couple had come up from San Francisco, and they introduced this you know, chanting Hare Krishna that they had, you know, seen in Haight-Ashbury or wherever. So this is like, whoa, this sounds like 
really far out. You know, that would be a really good thing to join. Hippie life was getting pretty uh, repulsive. They had been burnt out in the counterculture. They were just, you know, too much drugs, too much sex, too much out of control, wanting something stable in their lives and having some meaning in their lives. A friend of mine told me about Love Celebration at Compton Square Park, and uh, I had been, I knew I had been seeking a guru for a while. So Krishna sent me there, and I was there. And uh, after meeting some of the initiates, I knew that, that, that the Swami really had to be into something. This was great. This was, uh, yeah, it was tough at first. I mean, you were just, for the first six months, you are a little bit like in a, in a daze. <laughs> parents didn't know what to think. He, he was shocked when I became a hippie, so to, to him it was just another thing I was into, some weird thing. Well, I guess they were all very worried about me. They were very worried, but they knew I had good intentions. Anna Keys, raised a Catholic, had drifted away from her faith as a teenager. That's what led me to the Hare Krishnas later on, you see, because of my search for God. I needed him back in my life. So I was willing to do anything and everything in order to get back on track. Cynthia Greenwood, also raised Catholic, was impressed by those who joined. There were doctors, there were lawyers, there were uh, mostly university people attending university at the time. And it was just so charismatic and it was just so... Some, somehow caught you and held you and then it was too late. <laughs> Once you got through the, you know, the shock and the mental agitation, then it was quite blissful. When kids ditch their religious upbringing, shave their heads, wrap themselves in robes, and give up most of their worldly possessions and passions, you've got to figure that someone with a whole lot of appeal is pulling them in. That someone was a man from India named Prabhupada. We're talking about somebody really who really is an extraordinary person. So, sociologists talk about, you know, people with charisma. You know, Prabhupada was certainly one of those people with charisma. If anyone knows a lot about Prabhupada, it's Professor Burke Rochford of Middlebury College. Since the early 1970s, when Rochford was a graduate student at UCLA, he's been intrigued by the Hare Krishnas and by the amazing life history of A.C. Bhaktivedanta Swami Prabhupada. He was educated in English schools. Uh, he was a manager in a, in a chemical firm, uh, a, a man of great business sense and wisdom. And he was devoutly religious, a high caste Hindu who spent much of his life in India studying under a guru. That guru was a member of a small, charismatic Hindu denomination known as Hare Krishna. Hare Krishna is a modern manifestation of a very ancient Vaishnava Hindu tradition. Anudama Das is a member of, and spokesman for, the governing commission of modern-day Krishnas. The Vaishnava tradition is based on the Sanskrit writings of India that go back at least 5,000 years. It's one of the dominant denominations, if you will, in India. 500 years ago, there was a great saint named Chaitanya who revitalized the tradition with a particular emphasis on the Hare Krishna chanting. Chaitanya dismissed most Hindu denominations as stuffy and elitist. He figured everyone, regardless of caste, should feel free to celebrate the love of God, often pictured as blue-skinned Krishna by enthusiastically dancing, singing, and chanting. I mean, he was a revolutionary. He was disliked by the establishment at, at the time because he was offering uh, this whole process to people that were disqualified previously. 
you know, because they weren't Brahmin, they weren't born in the right family, didn't have the right education. In 1896, Prabhupada himself was born a Brahmin, yet he too eventually embraced the Hare Krishna's populist message. Very few it took to this, uh, this practice as strictly as he did. But Prabhupada's enthusiasm wasn't shared by his wife and children. He had great difficulties in his marriage for many, many years. It was a, not, not really a marriage of love. Clinical psychologist Dr. Arnold Weiss of Los Angeles spent many years studying Prabhupada and his North American devotees. At the age of 50, he became a sannyasi, which is the renounced order of life, basically monkhood, after you raise a family and provide economically, physically, and socially for the family and for the children. You then at that point leave that life and go as a missionary. But Prabhupada was reportedly stunned when his guru gave him an assignment. Leave India, he was told, and spread the word of Hare Krishna throughout the Judeo-Christian stronghold of North America. He knew nothing about the West. When he was sent to the West, he told his spiritual master, how can I go? I, I know nothing about the culture. Coming to America really without sponsorship at the age of 69 years old with very, very little money in his pocket finds himself on the Lower East Side of New York um, in Tompkins Square Park where he just went each day, sat under a tree in Tompkins Square Park and chanted. That's it. That's how it started. In 1966, a year after arriving, Prabhupada incorporated his religion using the rather optimistic title, the International Society for Krishna Consciousness, known commonly these days as the acronym ISKCON. He begins attracting some of this musician bohemian crowd. They gathered in a cramped storefront, an old gift shop in New York's Bowery District. Some small number of, of, of that crowd that are attracted to him, a few of them take initiation from him in New York. So he has a base then in New York. One of Prabhupada's earliest followers went to San Francisco, where he was organizing rock and roll shows. He wrote to Prabhupada, asking him to come out west. And it's there where all this really takes off. The Summer of Love, Haight Ashbury, a groovy looking old man, bald, barefoot, preaching about Godhead and enlightenment, had settled smack in the middle of thousands of potential converts. And here's this Indian guru sitting there who's talking about these things that they, they really didn't really understand on the one hand, they couldn't understand his accent on the other hand, but they knew somehow that this man was bringing them a kind of spiritual knowledge that they ought to know about, and it was just far out. Uh, my mission is to preach uh, the philosophy of Lord Chaitanya, chanting Hare Krishna, Hare Krishna, Krishna Krishna, Hare Hare, Hare Rama, Hare Rama, Rama Rama, Hare Hare. Within a year and a half, he had 200 converts. Most were young and with nowhere else to live, moved in to the Hare Krishna temple. That means that they now, that Prabhupada begins to ask them that they, they live according to certain principles, that they not eat meat, that they not take intoxication, that they not be involved in illicit sex, that they not gamble, that they, that they begin chanting rounds. If you're not a Hare Krishna, it's still likely you've heard the Hare Krishna chant. Hare is, uh, refers to Radha, or the feminine aspect of God, and Krishna is a name of God that means the all-attractive. So when we chant this prayer, Hare Krishna, that people Hare see us chanting Hare off, and this is actually, it's a meditation or prayer that's asking God, uh, my dear Lord, O oh, energy of the Lord, please engage me in your service. For devout Christians, the ultimate goal is eternal life in heaven. 
for devout Hindus, including the Hare Krishnas, the ultimate goal is to escape eternal reincarnation. If one is a lover of God, whatever their religious faith or practice, if they develop love for God, they go to the kingdom of God. And if we have, uh, have other desires, then God allows us to have another body. It's called reincarnation or karma. We get another body, material form, to allow us to fulfill our desires. Man proposes and God disposes. Govinda Jaya Jaya Gopal Jaya Jaya Radha Ramana Hari Govinda Jaya By the mid-1970s, devotees were having children. Inevitably, those children needed teachers and classrooms. Boarding schools, a familiar choice for offspring of wealthy Americans, were also favored by Prabhupada. That's how he had been schooled in India. The elite had their children go to overnight schools where they could sleep and be fed and taken care of. And he brought that idea to this country where he felt the same thing could be done. Prabhupada often said, and others often repeat, that, you know, that, that your own spiritual advancement is enhanced by being in an environment with other devotees. In fact, it's true. The schools were called Garukulas. This one was in Los Angeles. In most parochial schools of any denomination, religion plays a big part in the lesson plan. Hare Krishna Gurukulas were no exception. Who was Krishna exactly? I know. All right, tell me. He's the great personality of God. Ah, all right. <laughs> Who was Krishna? He's God, and he lived 5,000 years ago on this, on this earth planet. Why did he come here? Why did God come here? To save all the conditions, to kill the demons and save his devotees. Prabhupada openly encouraged parents to send their children away. He wanted every boy and girl to live full time in a Garukula once they turned five years old. As soon as I was almost going to turn five, they were like, oh my God, we have to find a school for her. So the leaders had told us that it was like a, a you know, sending your child to public school is just as bad as sending her to the slaughterhouse. You may as well just slaughter your child right now. I just felt it was the right thing to do. I felt I loved this person so much, I wanted to see her get the best, you know, and I felt that was the best thing to do. They went, drove all around, like, Canada and the U.S. looking for the best school for me, and everybody kept telling them, oh, New Vrindavan's really good. So they brought me there, and they dropped me off, and <laughs> went back to Toronto. At New Vrindavan in West Virginia, Lakshmi learned almost immediately what Garukula life had in store. Everything comfortable or pleasurable was forbidden. Like, everything comfortable. Like, that's why we slept on sleeping bags, like on a hard floor. Um, we didn't have socks a lot of the time. We didn't have, like, those were just comforts that were material, and um, they didn't want us to identify with anything material. All devotees, including young school children, were expected to awaken each morning in the dark, several hours before sunrise. Most of the time, I would slink down into my sleeping bag and pull the covers up over my head and then they would, in order to get me out, they would take it from the bottom and hold it vertically and bash me out onto the ground and then drag me across the floor and fling me into the cold shower. For the next three hours, starting around 4 a.m., everyone in the temple chanted, prayed, and listened to sermons. It was sometimes cold and stomachs were always empty. There's nothing good about waking up 3, 2.30 in the morning 
and having to pray for hours. Everybody had their weird way of chanting in the adults. Like some people would be, you know, quietly doing it. Others would be like loudly screaming the, the chant. Some would be up against the wall banging their head. And I remember you get to this phase where you're sitting down and you're hungry, you're tired and you're fed up and you have to chant these freaking mantras. That, that's what I remember feeling. And you go into this daze. Then you go home, clean the ashram, and then we got breakfast, which by then, you know, we're starving, starving. And, and then if we had done anything bad the whole program, like anything within that four hour period or whatever, from the time we woke up, then we didn't get breakfast. So, you know, which was often, often. In the classroom, lessons in reading, writing, and arithmetic, usually with a Krishna twist. The world outside the Hare Krishnas was demonic. That's the way we were told, I mean. And they especially liked to use the karmi, the meat eaters. The, anybody who didn't believe in the Hare Krishnas was a karmi, and chances were good that they were a meat eater. And chances were that if you somehow got into their midst, they wouldn't really have too much of a hesitation eating you either. The one movie that we used to get to watch that had karmis in it, which were non-devotee demon people, was the movie The Day After. And we watched it a lot. That's the movie where it's uh, middle America has just experienced a nuclear attack and yeah. bombs. Have gone. Yeah. And that was the movie they let you see? Yeah, that was the only movie that we watched that had non Hare Krishna people in it. It was like, see, look at these people. They're talking about all this trivial stuff, and the nuclear bomb can come at any time and kill you. Were you getting an education? Oh, I knew Sanskrit well. I could, uh, yeah, I could write, and I could read. Did you know that men had walked on the moon? Um, I had heard that, but we were taught that it was a lie. Did you know that the Earth was round? The Earth no, they didn't really teach that either. Every all of the social sciences were all, you know, the creation of Krishna, everything was taken back to like Vedic kind of mythology. They didn't believe in teaching you, you know, geology. The mountains are created by God. The Garukulas had rules, plenty of rules. Break one and your teacher acted swiftly. Everything that you could do was wrong. Like if you didn't do everything perfectly and you didn't, I mean, it was like, this is the routine and you do it exactly like this, otherwise it, you're bad, it's wrong. I remember urinating in my sleeping bag and having my face pushed into it and the stinging of my urine in my eyes and the smell of it. If you would soil your underwear then and they and they caught you, you know, before you sort of hit it in the laundry, it would be, it would be ward on your head so you would not only, you know, learn yourself through humiliation but other people would learn to wipe themselves properly. She, she always found like really sadistic little punishments for them like, oh, you stole a cookie? Okay, you have to sit down with this huge bowl of sugar and eat the whole thing. Otherwise, you know, like just weird stuff, you know, making kids eat till they were puking and stuff. And then we'd be let into the room to be beaten with a stick that they, and then they would ask like, do you remember all the things that you've done? And you would answer in the affirmative that you do and you'd be let out having to eat things off the floor if they spilled. If I spilled a glass of milk, I'd have to get up on all fours and drink off the floor. There was a few cellars, but one of them was in the Seattle temple. It was the scariest one under, underneath the temple building. She locked me in this basement that was um, just the earth exposed, like no walls. Like she locked me down the trap door and um, it was really terrifying. Girls learned early on that they faced a different future than boys. The women have not proven themselves very capable of managing things, you know, day-to-day -day affairs and money. So as far as management of the temple and planning the preaching efforts and guiding our society worldwide, the women don't do those things so well. But they're very expert in other areas, and especially having babies. In the Vedic literature, it's very clearly stated that this is the fulfillment for women. 
I mean, you're told constantly that you have a much smaller brain, that you're not as intelligent, that your main purpose is to serve men. When you ask, oh, why can't the woman do this? Or why can't, because that was your karma. You came as a woman. That's a terrible karma to come as a woman. Women were basically just these, besides being lesser of intelligence and class and whatever else, they were um, temptresses. We would then be punished for appearing alluring or even if we were just, you know, doing our own thing and dancing because we were the we were the ones responsible, as women, was responsible for men's reactions to us. So from the age of eight or nine years old, all this time that I'm getting molested, it's my karma, it's my fault. If life in North American garugulas seemed brutal, well, Ben Bresick may have had it even worse. Now living in Florida, Ben treasures time alone with his son, kind of parent-child contact he never knew himself growing up. Oh, beautiful. Yeah, right now. <laughs> Flick it out a little bit. Get it. I, I never remember living with my mother. I, my mother sent me to school in 72. I was born in 69, and that was the last time I lived with my mother in my entire life. Like many Hare Krishna boys, Ben was shipped off to a boarding school in India. The running water was gravity fed from the roof. It was completely bacteria filled. We had dysentery. We didn't have flushable toilets. Um, the, the living conditions were extreme. To, to, that's to put it bluntly. We didn't have any glass in our, wind, in our holes. There was bars. It was a prison. This is like going back to like middle age Europe. Prabhupada said when we were sent to India, we should uh, learn to be happy begging for our food on the street. Nirmal Hickey, now also living in Florida, shared many of Ben Bresick's childhood traumas. Oh, I've cried. I've cried more than I, w I would ever want to know. I've cried like a lot, a lot. <laughs> Years I've cried, spent crying. They were building a $10 million temple out of granite right there, 100 feet from where we lived. Not, not, not like somewhere else, right there. And there was a couple hundred students there that didn't have enough food, medical care. They were giving us shots for malaria and stuff with used needles. I mean, I had a needle break inside my arm. There's no excuse for that. Every day we'd have to recite the Ten Offenses. And before we ate, every time we'd eat, we'd have to recite in their, the language that they use and in English, this prayer that's about our food. My dear Lord, this material body is a lump of ignorance. The senses are networks of past leading to death. Somehow or other, I have fallen into this ocean of material sense enjoyment. Of all the senses, the tongue is the most voracious and difficult to control, but you have given us this food to help us overcome the tongue. So now let us take this food and in so doing, glorify your lordships. They just didn't care about us children. They didn't care. They were more interested in building temples and propagating or trying to build their empire big to attract followers. Yet again, former students blame their teachers. But in India, much of the alleged abuse was sexual. It was the teachers, it wasn't anybody else, that one of the teachers in India was so uh, flaming. I mean, he dressed in dresses, he wore dresses, he was, uh, it was obvious. I mean, and then there was these older Indian kids that were there, and uh, they were like bringing kids in their room at all hours of the night, you know, um, with the door open. I was anally molested. I, I gave oral sex to men, um, any, type of, any type of possible, one guy stuck his 
foot in my anus. I mean, one teacher. I mean, I'm just telling you, there, any level of sexuality can be... I was raped in my sleep while I was sick by men. I mean, you know, had no bigger people than me. I was just a kid. I could not even move. There's no chance of fighting or whatever. I just took it as it may. Ben knew it was painful, but he didn't know he was being victimized. He was isolated from parents, from law enforcement, from Western culture. As he grew older, he tried to complain. Then they said that I was a habitual liar and that I was a demon trying to overthrow their movement at the age of 10. They said that I was just a bad kid. And in reality, I was a kid that was dying. Nirmal had been suffering for years. When he was six, he spent three lonely months in a hospital after falling into a vat of boiling milk at this Krishna boarding school in France. No follow-up care. Never brought to the doctor to look at the burns again after that. Deeply depressed, Nirmal considered suicide. I went on the roof and I was like standing up there on the rail, like putting one foot off the roof edge like you know sort of waiting for somebody to come up and like talk me down hope I guess subconsciously anyway nobody none of the teachers came up they were I told them I was going to kill myself and they just sort of like go ahead it only served to make Nirmal angrier yet by the mid 1980s the little boys who had been such easy targets were growing up the, the kids that they had been used to abusing were getting big and that was not easy it was Threat. I mean, a couple of us were contemplating, you know, revenge. And I was just a child, and I had no, there was no reason why I had to suffer through that. I came from a, a decent family in this country. There was no reason why I had to be subjected to those tortures. I was not born in India. I didn't have to go through that. If children in Garukulas were suffering, where were their parents? Neither my mother or father actually took an interest in what was happening in the Garukula. I didn't ever see them in there. I never ever saw them having any kind of like altercation with the teachers or asserting their right as a parent. Maybe they didn't know because they weren't involved in our lives. I mean, they were completely brainwashed, meditating and praying to Krishna. That's what's the hardest thing, and it is really messed up, is that your parents are so into this cult that they don't even see what's going on with their children. I remember walking down the road with my friends, which, you know, we walked everywhere. Those were some moments where we could talk a little bit sometimes, and I, I used to say to my friends, like, do you ever think that maybe like all of our parents just got together and like tried to create this experiment just to see what it would be like to raise kids like this? In truth, many parents were simply immersed in the strict requirements and routines of their faith. After hours of prayer, chanting, and chores, most devotees were expected to head out into public for something called sankraton. A daily duty of proselytizing and fundraising. They had teams of devotees that would go out every single day and make maybe three to four or five hundred dollars a day. Some devotees worked crowds at big city airports. Okay, I'll give you one more. Others endured grueling weeks of travel from small town to small town. I remember being in a van and, and have, you know, sleeping in the van and then having to go and take a shower in a gas station, you know, like just with a bucket of water and, you know, something with a drain. For those who were in, who are the renunciates, who were the leaders, distributing Prabhupada's books and this missionary activity was the central activity. That was the activity of the movement at that particular time. The leaders 
wanted to segregate this, the children from the parents so that the parents could work full time. And so suddenly an institution that started with, with, with the purpose of educating children suddenly was there primarily because it provided the ability of a movement to give childcare to children that weren't entirely valued by the leadership of the institution. And it just got worse and worse and worse and there was nowhere to go. Like, my parents couldn't save me, like, nobody could. It was just like, I was here, I was in hell, and I just had to accept it. For some Krishnas, breaking the bond between parent and child was more than they could bear. Cynthia Greenwood is Maya Charnell's mother. And I saw her. And I talked to her uh, once in an ashram situation where the kids were talking about the flying dates, which were the big cockroaches, right? <laughs> that, uh, but other than that, that I saw her only from a distance. And uh, well, I remember her being so small, that's all. And she had a shaved head. And she was so, she was just so small. And we got a phone call, and it was the teacher saying that she had been in the hospital for a week because they lanced a boil on her leg. And her leg had gotten a size three, three times bigger than it actually was. We didn't know. No one told us, you know. And here this poor little girl is in the hospital, and we don't even know about it because they didn't even bother calling us. And did that not ring a bell to you to say, my gosh, what are we doing with this? Why, you know, who are these people with my daughter? Uh, yeah, not at that point, no. Obviously, didn't, the bell didn't ring. Because, in fact, Garukula teachers were instructed to keep parents and children apart. The leadership, even, even Prabhupada himself, thought that the ropes of affection between the parent and the child were, were a, a detriment to their ability to kind of um, develop within spiritual life. Any relationship here is false. There's no reality to any relationship. The parent-child bond is false. It means nothing. So consequently, very often, parents were, were not only not encouraged, but often very actively discouraged from taking an active role with their children, at least during that period that they were in the Guru Kula. My mother was not allowed to hug me, to kiss me, to hold me. When they came to the hospital, I didn't know who they were. Like, they were smiling at me, and I'm like, who are those people looking at me? And then I was like, oh my god, that's my parents. And my mom got pulled aside, and I got pulled aside. And I was told that I should know better. That I had to teach my mother to learn how to be detached. That's exactly the word that he used. Detached. You have to teach your mother detachment. Affection means nothing. You're better off not having love for your child. Detaching. So right off the bat, you say you love a child. It means you give them affection. You prepare them for school. You make sure they're not sick. When they say they love their children, they say, I'm preparing this child to surrender, to give up their life to their guru, have no material possession for their entire life to have no ambition, so you're talking about a whole different thing right off the bat. If parents couldn't or wouldn't intervene, what about the teachers? An ashram teacher had 15 or 20 children that they were fully responsible for. You know, fully responsible for. You know, with young children that means wash, cooking, maintaining young children um, on a daily basis. And I think that many of them, as, as one might expect, found that extraordinarily difficult to accomplish. They weren't cut out to be, you know, teaching children, and a lot of them just walked off the street, and they were hippies, or they were just, they needed a place to crash, they needed a place to stay, and they're not good at sankirtan, they're not good at cooking. Well, let's make them a teacher. 
It was something that was seen as very low status work. Um, the real business of the movement was distributing these books. You had not been able to accomplish the real business of that, of the movement. And so you found yourself in, in a situation of, of tending children in, in, in an ashram. Sadly, word got out among predatory men in the dark world of pedophilia. The children in Hare Krishna Garukulas were an easy mark. There were diabolical people who, who physically harmed people, young children, young boys, young girls, who, who sexually abused young boys particularly, and also young girls. But most teachers were not pedophiles. Inexperienced, underappreciated, and overworked, many simply lashed out in frustration and exhaustion. In much of this physical abuse, at least, I think it was just circumstance that, um, that set people off who really should have never been there. It's amazing how people my age would want to do that to children, like people my age, you know, and seemingly, you know, in the hippie movement, the, you know, love and peace type of uh, era would want to, you know, create so much terrible, horrible acts eh, to children. I mean, it's, it's amazing. That the Hare Krishnas should face allegations of sex abuse is a paradox. Illicit sex is among the religion's gravest sins, and any kind of sex, one of its biggest preoccupations. You know, there was a constant kind of concern about this question of sexuality. And I think that, I think in, in some cases, they, they saw the power of it. And I think in ways were overly repressive of their own children because they themselves were so fearful of, of their own sexuality and their own urges in that particular way. I mean, we didn't talk to girls, period. I was scared to look at it. The teacher would stand in back of the, whenever we were around in the same place as the girls, he would stand be between our line of sight. And if we tried to look at a girl, he'd be like glaring at us with the, all the anger that he could muster. They were so against sex that I think they became like hyper aware of sex. Because um, I remember this one lecture and they would compare, okay, why would you want to kiss somebody? You are after all a skin bag. Imagine if you were to fill a plastic bag with pus and stool and urine, and then would you kiss that bag? That's what kissing another person is. I ended up getting together with girls in the boarding school when I was probably seven. And it was just, I think, um, other girls would usually always start it with me and later I've realized that it's probably because they were getting molested why they were even like thinking so sexually but we would do sexual things together and it was that was when we hugged each other and but it was very like we knew that it was sinful and bad and but it was just pretty much all we had. One of the aspects of this community is that the men and women are segregated as much as possible. Attitudes about sex began with attitudes about marriage. For men, celibacy was the highest calling. Marriage was a sign of spiritual weakness. The leadership themselves were celibate male monks, and they were, they were preaching against marriage. They were preaching against family. So that these, these gurukulas themselves were kind of, if you will, for, for many of the renunciates, a kind of product of, of, of people spiritually falling down. That they couldn't control themselves, they couldn't maintain celibacy. So they, they took another route. They got married, they had children. Chris Carlson is no longer a Hare Krishna. He says his marriage to Lakshmi's stepmom in the early 1980s was a sham. Basically, three types of uh, families, I guess you could call it. <laughs> what does that mean you were separate? You were living separate. What does that mean? We didn't live together. She lived somewhere and I lived somewhere. So why call it husband and wife? I don't know. I don't know. 
people were placed together that, that a man and a woman wanted to get married. And uh, the authorities sought to kind of make a match. Now, how was that match made? Well, often in a very haphazard kind of way. I didn't even want to get married at the time. And when Chris told me he wanted a child, I told him I'm too young. Anna Keys was Chris Carlson's first wife and Lakshmi's mom. Now, in the Hare Krishna movement, you can only have sex when you want to have a child, right? And then you, you chant on your beads for about maybe 12, 14 hours before you can even think about, about that, right? So, but lucky me, I got pregnant every time, right? So I had three children, I tried four times in 12 years. So this is nothing spontaneous. This is nothing based upon, you know, some kind of principle of enjoyment. This is based on a principle of, that, that a very serious one, of that you, you are trying to bring a child into this world and that that is your one and only purpose. If the rules about sex were sometimes confusing, it may explain in part why the early whispers about abuse were overlooked. It's nothing to them. Sexual abuse means nothing. It's as, it, having sex with a woman is as bad as having sex with a child. It's all the same to them. Sex is sex. That's what Prabhupada said. No matter what you do, it's sinful. So it seems like that's one of the reasons why there's so much abuse in child molestation, because it's all wrong. I mean, no matter what you do, it's wrong. So then you lose the degrees of morality. Back at the West Virginia Temple, Chris Carlson finally began hearing rumors about child abuse. And I was like, oh my God, I gotta get out of here. And uh, so that's when we were like, yeah, we're going to Minneapolis, yeah, you bet, we're gonna go, <laughs> we'll start a temple in the North Pole if we, you know, we just wanted to exit. I remember like pretty much forcing my dad to take me with him. This is Lakshmi at 12 years old. She is horrified that classmates her same age have been forced to marry men twice their age. Rather daringly, she shares hints of rebellion with a visiting filmmaker. We go to practically every night. To so where? Through. Weekends. Where do you go Whatever. every night? Like, just places that are out in town. Here, here within the community, right here. Where? <laughs> Just saying, please. Like to the movies and stuff like that. And looking back in retrospect now, that was my saving grace because I listened to my daughter. She saw things. Kids see everything. And she knew what was going on. And she kept, you know, lend me your ears, Dad. I got something to say. And I'd be like, no way, no way. But then it started to make sense. One day, Lakshmi left the Garukula for good. Suddenly, she found herself surrounded by non-devotees in public school. It was terrifying. It was, I mean, we had been taught that everybody who wasn't a Hare Krishna was demons. And um, I really believed that still, even though I felt like, well, <laughs> there's demons like everywhere. So, but I was really scared of the other kids. But Lakshmi, deeply scarred, quickly drifted. She turned to alcohol, crack cocaine, even heroin, and lived on the streets of Minneapolis. You know, we would just wake up in the morning or in the afternoon and panhandle till we had enough money to buy alcohol, and I was really good at panhandling, and so I'd panhandle most of the money and uh, get alcohol and acid and whatever we could and, and just get as inebriated as we could so we didn't have to think or feel anything. The abuse of Hare Krishna children was at its worst in the late 70s and throughout the 1980s. Those dates are important because much of it happened after 1977, the year Prabhupada died. It's like the loss of an ancient king in a kingdom in the old days. You lose the king, you lose direction. 
His authority holds everyone together. His authority keeps everyone from bickering. His authority prevents the differences between people from manifesting. When he's gone, differences manifest. Prabhupada dies in 1977. Eleven successor gurus followed. There's a real question even to this day as to whether they were appointed by Prabhupada or whether they uh, appointed themselves, if you will, as gurus. But what we do know is that of those 11, the majority of them have fallen down in one way or another. There's one of them that ended up marrying a 12-year-old girl. Uh, he was one of the gurus. There's another one that was making porn movies before he even joined. And he was into pedophilia. Everybody knew about that. They had everything they needed. They had nice food, they had nice living conditions, and they would almost flaunt it. Okay, they were building the temples out in New Vrindavan that were leafed with gold. They were building these huge projects in Mayapur, gigantic temples, and that's where a lot of money was funneled through. Some gurus, including the leader of the West Virginia temple, were imprisoned amid a wave of drug dealing, extortion, and contract killings. Book distribution went down, uh, the Gurukulas closed in the mid-1980s. Suddenly, you know, the, the, the temple president taps you on the shoulder and says, Prabhu, you're going to have to move outside of the temple because we can't support you anymore, okay? We don't have the funds to do this. By 1990, it was increasingly common for people to dismiss the Hare Krishnas as a misguided cult. It is a cult, you know. Uh... There's a lot of brainwashing going on, and, uh, you know, I believe that um, anything that's got mind control over people is a cult. Cult is a very pejorative term that is directed oftentimes without much information. We tend to point to people who are different than us as being so far different that they're not as good as we are. In India, Christianity might be considered a cult, but Hinduism is considered to be a majority religion. In this country, Hinduism may be a cult and Christianity a majority religion. I think one thing that a lot of people don't understand is, is that um, not too much different from the Catholic tradition. We have monastic orders or people that live in a renounced or like a monk, and then we have uh, the majority of our members are members of a congregation that live and work nine to five jobs just as uh, as most people do and, and go to temple uh, on a weekly basis or some people uh, once a year for the most important holidays. Krishna children though are exposed to intense rituals, stark imagery and violent parables of terrors like flesh ripping deities. Catholic children brought up in Catholic school are taught that they will burn in eternal hell, that the devil will be torturing them. Uh, they learn this at very, very early age. They become frightened. Uh, is that any different? I don't think so. As scandals spread, thousands of Krishna faithful abandoned the movement. But it never faded away. Recent immigrants from India and East Asia now make up almost 50% of the North American membership. While Krishnas still chant in public and solicit small donations from strangers, they also run a chain of profitable vegetarian restaurants. Krishna Sheik is still occasionally part of pop culture, as when Madonna appeared on MTV. Even Madison Avenue uses the Krishna image to sell snack food. The Krishnas are active in interfaith organizations and have even worshipped in the National Cathedral in Washington, D.C. The Interfaith Conference of Metropolitan Washington. And lately, they've increased their missionary work outside North America, particularly in places of turmoil, like South Africa, Bosnia, and Eastern Europe. A Krishna hospital recently opened its doors in India. Throughout the 1990s, young adults who had been raised in Garukulas began to hold reunions. People like Acharya Becca shared chilling stories about teachers who demanded sex from little boys. If you refused, you know, 
to do anything with him. Either he would hit you or, you know, he'd, he'd be violent, you know, angry. And if you still wouldn't do anything, he'd try and force you, obviously. If he wouldn't, then what he'd make you do is uh, sleep in the bathroom floor with nothing. But unlike other Garukula graduates, Becca blames his teacher, not the entire Krishna movement. To me, that wasn't the religion's fault that someone did that to me. Because religion is a philosophy. Despite years of suffering, Becca is still a Krishna. So is Draupadi Zapetio who says she never once saw or experienced sexual, physical, or emotional abuse. I think actually it taught me a lot of discipline and responsibility that has rolled over to my whole adulthood now. I mean, getting through high school and college and starting a career that I wanted. Um, I attribute a lot of that to the Gurukul discipline. But at those Gurukula reunions, the tales of horror began to surface. By the mid-1990s, the top brass in ISKCON dropped their curtain of silence and openly confronted the mounting charges of abuse. It's terrible, it's heart-wrenching, it's horrific, it's uh, saddening. Uh, we could use so many words. Including the words, it's true. Unfortunately, many individuals affiliated with our organization at that time uh, abused children. Any type of abuse is, is horrible and unacceptable, and abuse of children is, is the worst. Uh, sexual abuse of children, it, it's unfathomable how this can occur. Anudama Das and the rest of the Krishna's governing body agreed to commission an independent investigation. Most of the former students' allegations were confirmed and then made public in a report by Professor Burke Rochford. And I think people were within the movement were facing the tragedy of what had happened and were seeing this as a way for the movement to finally acknowledge, recognize, and begin to do something to deal with this issue, which in ways they have. Have they done it perfectly? Have they done enough? I think not. But nonetheless, the fact of the matter is that this is the way that this particular story has come out. We have profound moral responsibility to help our young people. There are kids. Amid growing pressure, ISKCON agreed to put some money where their mouths were. In 1996, we established an organization, uh, Children of Krishna, specifically to help with grants and education to help young people. And in 1997, a task force was established to assure that all the children were safe. At the same time, ISKCON tried to change the focus. Scholars have shown that abuses, they, they tend to oftentimes target religious organizations, people that are sexual predators because they know that there will be children that will be there that will be accessible to them. They know that general religious people tend to be uh, more trusting. I suspect that there are very few people in the United States and throughout the world who haven't picked up a newspaper and have read about, in their own countries, about a particular church or a particular denomination where there has been allegations of uh, child molestation on the part of priests or other clergy. That's something that is, is, is more commonplace than I think people would want to admit to. And no one should think, because I'm not Catholic or I'm not Hare Krishna or I'm not uh, you know, Native American, that my kids aren't at risk or this can't happen in my institution because everybody's at risk and everybody should be very, very, very careful. These days, the center of Krishna activity in North America is in the reclaimed swampland of Alachua in north central Florida on property donated in large part by a great-grandson of Henry Ford. He used to wear these really thick glasses. Bottle. Not far from the Alachua Temple, Nirmal Hickey leads a crusade against the Krishnas. Using the internet, Nirmal built a network of former Garukula students who reject ISKCON's offer of money for counseling. It's too late for that. 
It's way too late for that, you know. It's, it's just beyond that. Nirmal is in a wheelchair, a quadriplegic, an injury sustained when he fell out of a tree at a Hare Krishna farm when he was 16. I've never experienced this before. I can't move any of my body. I can't. That's what I was thinking. I was thinking. I didn't know about broken neck. I didn't know what a spinal cord was. I didn't know anything like that. Two devotees in a house adjacent to the tree um, brought out a, a ply board, like a half inch. They didn't want bad publicity. Um, plus, there was a whole part of the philosophy that said it was, this was a thing we heard like every day more than once. You're not your body. So, you know, don't be attached to your body. It doesn't mean anything. If Krishna loves you, he'll take everything away from you to make you surrender. That's what, that was the line. And so, um, for, what, for whatever reason, they, they didn't brace my neck. They rolled me onto my side. They carried the ply board and they put it in the back of one of the temple cars. Nirmal and other former students turned to Dallas lawyer Wendell Turley. In 1997, Turley convinced a Texas jury that years of sexual abuse by a Catholic priest should cost the Archdiocese of Dallas $119 million. He later settled with the church for $23.4 million. I can't speak for what's in the mind of all the hundred plus uh, uh, victims that we represent, uh, but I see it like this. Mostly these now young adults need vindication and they need validation. They were made to believe that they were to blame for the bad things that happened to them. In June 2000, Turley filed a civil complaint against the International Society of Krishna Consciousness and the estate of Prabhupada, seeking $400 million in damages. We need to impress upon institutions, even religious institutions, that you're not immune from the obligations and responsibilities you have to children. You have to look out for their welfare. And in the United States, First Amendment or not, you cannot mistreat and injure children, even if you do it in the name of your God. There have been some, I think a minority for sure, but who are very angry with the, the plaintiffs in this particular case because of uh, the, 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 the suit itself has implicated Prabhupada. We have alleged uh, that he did know about some of the sexual abuse. We've alleged that he knew about the physical beatings. Uh, we, we have alleged that he knew about some of the general conditions under which these children were being kept, particularly in the, uh, during the mid-70s. Prabhupada was very clear that the most important principle of taking care of children is that there be a loving, protective environment. In India, there's a culture historically that is more tolerant of physical discipline. Prabhupada said, no, you can't physically discipline our children. He was very clear about that. Now, as far as sexual abuse and so on is concerned, that was never sanctioned by Prabhupada. He wanted the very best for his people as he did for himself. But he was only human. There was just so far a general could do to controlling the privates in his army. I do think he was responsible. How so? Well, he set up the system. He's the one that told the parents to send their children off to Gurukulas. I think the responsibility falls on Prabhupada, really, that it was his system. He devised it. We were his we were his servants. We did what he wanted with our children. We thought, we thought he had a divine vision of how they should be raised. Jeffrey Hickey could be a key witness. He was the man in charge of all the Garukulas during much of the abuse. And I think a lot of people would point their fingers at me, saying because I was the Minister of Education, it should have been my responsibility to see that these things didn't happen. I was doing what Prabhupada wanted. His instructions are clear. Jeffrey Hickey is also the father of Nirmal Hickey. Jeffrey is often consumed with guilt. For sure. Looking back on my decision to become a follower of Bhaktivedanta, I can see that um, it was a reckless decision. It was a 
risk that I was taking. Right now, I just want to see them pay. I want to see them pay. I want to force them to pay. He's going after the organization. I wish he'd go after the individual perpetrators. No one's doing that except our own organization. But you know, things, unfortunately, bad things do happen in people's lives. And do I feel suing for $400 million is going to solve their problems? No, I don't. There's no question that if, if, if this suit is successful, ISCON as an organizational entity and the properties that are associated with that organization in all probability are be long gone. I don't really care. I don't care if they tear it down because I don't, I think that people need to be taken care of. I don't think there needs more churches to be built. I think that's excessive. As bad as abuse is, I don't think that a new kind of abuse to a new generation of families is the way to, to address the needs of victims. I think these kids should be able to be free, and I think that this money could help them. And, I don't, and, and as far as shutting down the Hare Krishna movement, psh, it was started under a tree. What the heck do they need? You know, you don't need a marble building to be religious or spiritual. They need to be held accountable, and the only way to hold them accountable is the law. You know, it would be wonderful that everything they ever did to me, I can do to them. Just in one space of like two hours in court. There's too much evidence and too many people and, uh, I mean, no one can deny what's happened. The former children of Krishna realize that somehow they have to get on with their lives. Some do better than others. Even today, even people have always tried to be kind to me and so forth and like talk to me and it's, it's very hard to accept that when you've, when you've been treated so harshly. It's very hard to accept. And so I, I met new people and it was just a very frightening experience. And even, you know, at my age now, it's still a frightening experience just dealing with people. There's a lot of fear. There's a lot of fear sitting here talking to you. You know, because I, I know that this is going to be watched by people that I once loved. A lot of us have been traumatized. More of us have been traumatized than we realize. Most of us get on with our lives, push our traumas away, or find ways in which we heal them. Many people don't. Those that don't heal them, repeat them. But must that healing include the end of the Hare Krishnas? I'm sure many out there are thinking, you know, well, we knew they were deviant, we knew that they were involved in something very sinister, and I guess they're getting their just desserts now. And if they get sued out of existence, that's all well and fine. But I think we have to realize that, you know, there, there are larger kind of religious questions here. That if, if the Krishnas can go down, then I think there are questions that are going to be raised to the extent that abuse is taking place in other churches and other denominations. It raises the question of what's going to happen there. So it's not a, it's not a minor case. It ends up being a significant case. There are kids. Whatever happens with a court case, these are our kids. And this is going to affect members of our faith for the next hundred years. They're going to look back and talk about the pain and the suffering that some of our kids underwent. So we absolutely have profound moral responsibility. So ISKCON may go down, right? and, and if Turley is successful, there's no doubt that it will go down. But you cannot underestimate the fact that we're talking about people of deep faith, and that something will emerge behind it. And what it will look like and how it will operate may look very different than ISKCON, but nonetheless it will exist because there are people of deep faith that continue to exist. And so those who embrace Hare Krishna remain confident that their faith will not be extinguished. Those who now reject Krishna survive its darkest demons by grasping to the thin hope that the future will be brighter. I'm not sure what I'd like to do in the future. My dad wants me to get an education, a good education right now so that I can go out and be something big in the world, but I don't know what it is.
हर राम हर राम 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 हर हर कृष्ण हर कृष्ण 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 हर 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 राम हर राम 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 हर 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 कृष्ण हर कृष्ण 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 हर 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 राम हर राम 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 हर हर नमो विष्णु पदाय कृष्ण पृष्ठा भूतले श्रीमते भक्ति वेदंत स्वामी नमिने नमस्ते सरस्वती देव गौरवाणी प्रचारिणे निर्विशेष शून्यवादी पाश्चात्यादिणे